Welcome to Fort Laramie Country Church. My name is Pastor Marty Rosted. We're glad you're here with us today. Before we get started, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we come right now just seeking you, seeking your direction in these trying times. Father, we're going to ask that we see how clear the message is that you've given us to share with the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you today a little bit. If, if you were here last week, we actually talked about who we are as a church. But Jesus has also given us a mission as his church. And we're going to look at that today. If you're not familiar with a mission, it's really who defines us and, and what defines us. I was with a company called D&D Farms. I was on the executive committee. We had about 250 employees. And when we met, there was actually a mission statement and if your company's serious about their mission statement, everything they do should parallel or go along with the mission statement. And they were really good about that, actually. When they made a decision, they would ask, does this coincide, does this go along with why we exist, what our mission statement is? It was really a wonderful company to work for, but they knew why they existed, and they knew what what, what, what their mission statement was all about, and they didn't separate the two. And it's the same with us as a church. We need to know what our mission is, and everything we do should align with our mission. Now, we're going to look at Jesus' last days here on earth, and we're going to look at uh, really one, some of the last things he told his disciples, which gives us some insight into the mission. And then we're going to look at one of the last prayers he had for his disciples, and that's going to give us some insight into who we are and what our mission is as a church. Matthew 28, 18, it's called the Great Commission, is, and you've probably heard this before or, or had it or read it or, or something, but it's Matthew 28, 18, uh, 19 and 20. This is actually in Matthew. This is actually some of the last words in Matthew, but he's talking to his disciples here. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I command you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Therefore, go. Now that I idea of therefore reflects back on Jesus who says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. He says, basically, the, the authority is mine to send you. I am sending you. Go, therefore. Therefore, go and make disciples. Now, the idea of go is being intentional. He didn't say, he didn't say, make them come. He didn't say, build it and they'll come. He says, go. That's intentional. That means we have to make an effort. In fact, if you've ever hear uh, a coaches sometimes when they're trying to encourage their team, now go get them, you know, and, and you'll hear cheers, go get them, the whole idea, go, be intentional about this. Uh, and as we go, uh, that takes work. It's effort on our part. Going is effort on our part. And, and maybe go to you is, is someone you work with. Maybe go to you as a family member. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe go means build a relationship with somebody so that you can share Christ and find that common denominator. Now, I've actually probably had more opportunities to share Christ as I've shot a bow with people, as I've hunted with people, as I've done different hobbies with people, walked alongside people. Those, that's the idea of going. But you still need to be intentional if we're going to do this. Nancy and I were on an airplane, uh, and and I and I didn't know. In fact, there was there was more than Nancy and I, and I wasn't sure who was going to get to sit together. Our seats weren't assigned, and actually, I didn't get to sit with Nancy. But I wasn't sure. But I wanted to be intentional that if I sat by somebody, I was going to be able to to share the gospel with them. And so I, on my way out of the house, I grabbed a biker's Bible. That's one of those little New Testaments, and it has a motorcycle kind of on the front of it. And sure enough, I sat by a guy that owned a pawn shop in Billings, Montana. Well, I started sharing with him, and I still remember. He says, hey, I've never seen a Bible with Chrome. But anyway, I virtually had that Bible. I was able to witness to him. He didn't give his life to Christ, but he listened. I was a witness. I was intentional. I had that Bible because I intentionally intended to witness to somebody on that airplane. You know, uh, that's our mission, 
is to go and make disciples and baptize and teach. He gave us our mission. Everything we should do should stem with that in mind. Hey, we're going to have a fellowship. How can we make disciples? That's how it should be. Teach them. The whole process, it's, 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 it's our mission. Our mission should be incorporated into every decision we make. And he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I will be with you. In fact, Jesus also talked about just before he left his disciples in Acts, Jesus had been crucified. He raised from the dead. He spent about 40 days with his disciples. Listen to what Acts 1.8. And this happened just before he left. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know what he just said? You don't have to do this on your own. I'll be with you through the Holy Spirit. He's going to empower us to witness. Don't try to do this on your own. We don't need to do it on our own. Let the Holy Spirit work through us. In fact, I have found as I start to share with people, and witness to people, if God's working with them, it's obvious. And that's just an indication to continue and share and witness. But I've also found that if I start pushing a point and God's not in it, I can actually close the door on that situation where, where uh, we have to be careful that we don't do that. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit working in your life and working in the lives of the people around you as we witness and share. That's critical if we're going to be witnesses. And then he told us where to go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of That means virtually everybody. He, he didn't exclude anything. Everywhere. Go everywhere. That's our mission. To make disciples wherever we go and to be intentional as we go and when we go. <coughs> Verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and the cloud hid him from their sight. This was the last thing he told the disciples. It was the most important thing. When, when our kids were young and we were going to be gone, we'd be leaving and we'd, and we'd look at the kids and don't forget. And we'd tell them the most important thing, not to forget. We told them the last thing. It's, 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 it's what he's doing here. Now you know your mission. You've been empowered. Go make disciples. It's the most important thing. It's the very last thing he said. I had a young man that had never preached before in Claremont and, and I asked him to preach and I knew he could and and a neat young guy, and, and as he was putting this together and sharing, he was kind of nervous about it, and, and, and we'd prayed about it, and he kind of shared his sermon. It was spot on. It was really good. But as I left, and he was still kind of pondering it, and I could tell the thing about it, I looked at him and says, just keep the most important thing, the most important thing. That's what Jesus just said to his disciples here. Keep the most important thing, the most important thing. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, not everybody here is going to be a Billy Graham. I mean, when we witness, don't expect to be a Billy Graham. God's called some people to be evangelists, but we're not used like that. Listen to this. In uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 9, Paul said it this way. Who then is Paul? Who then is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted water Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You know, and it said, so then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his labors. But what he was saying here is, is when you share Christ, they're not all going to accept Christ. You might plant that seed. You may water the seed somebody else has planted, but God gives the increase. We need to keep that in mind. Don't expect to be a Billy Graham when you go out and witness and everybody comes flocking to you. Sometimes all we do is plant. Sometimes all we do is water. But it all needs to be done. That process all needs to happen if we're going to be disciples and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And Jesus knew it wasn't going to be an easy task. He knew it wasn't going to be them. And I think we see this in one of his last prayers for his disciples. It's found in John 17, 14 through 18. We're going to be breaking that down into bite-sized pieces. John 17, 14. This is what he's praying. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, we know Jesus is not of the world. He's Jesus he is, he's, he's God's son. Uh, he entered the world through a virgin birth. He, when he left, he, uh, he ascended into a cloud, you know. Uh, truly, he's not of the world. Now it says, they, 
are not of this world. He's talking to disciples. We're not of, his, not of this world. <coughs> Philippians 3.20 says it this way. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we are eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power of that enabled him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. The problem we run into is we have to be in the world. And I'll tell you what, I, I love being an American. I, with all its problems, I love being an American. I wouldn't want to live any place else than the USA. I love living in Fort Laramie. But I'm not a citizen here. I am not a citizen here. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, your citizenship changes. You become a citizen of heaven. You, you know your home is eternal. You're not of this world. Our citizenship's in heaven. If sometimes you feel like you're out of place here, you don't fit here, there's a reason. You don't. You're not citizens here. You're foreigners here. We're just passing through. Now, since America's been founded, we were a Christian nation. We've been known as a Christian nation. Really, the pilgrims were Christian. Christians seeking freedom to worship. Uh, and then beginning about the mid-20th century, we become, started to become known as a post-Christian nation. Uh, the USA has moved God on the outward edge of public influence. And that's why we struggle with everything we watch going on. Because, we, because we're no longer, our country's no longer involving God in all they do and all the decisions. And, and, it, and it's sin. And, and so it's really hard. That's why we're so hard here, because, because it, it, our citizenship's not here. This isn't jiving with who we were even founded on, really. And so it's hard to watch that happen, so we struggle. But Jesus never told us to make them Americans. He said, make them my disciples. Make them citizens of heaven. Look what else Jesus prayed for his disciples here. In John 17, 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of this world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Even though we're citizens of heaven, we still have to live here on earth. Now, there's some, when I, I was raised in Montana, and there's, there's, we have the Hutterites up there. I had the privilege of actually going and eating a meal with them, and the guy I was with was doing some business with them. So I kind of ate with him, got to, got to meet him and talk to him. And I actually asked some questions. I said, now, why, why do you separate yourself from the world? Well, they feel that God told us to separate yourself from the world. So they virtually separate themselves from the world. Everybody gets the same food. Everybody gets the same kind of house. Everybody gets the same kind of clothes. And they feel that's what God intended. I don't believe that's what he said at all here. He says, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. God never intended this. If we're going to be his disciples and we're going to make disciples, we must live in this world, even if we disagree with, with what's going on. But the hard part is not living here, living here without, the hard part's living here without becoming part of the world. Second Timothy 2, 3, and 4 said this way. You, therefore, must endure hardships, living in this world, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. You know, it says entangled himself with the affairs of life. Now, I'll tell you what happens when we do entangle ourselves with the affairs of life. It steals from our mission. We start to see people who don't agree with us as the enemy. People aren't the enemy. They're our mission field. That's what he's in. The evil one will do everything he can <coughs> Excuse me, to distract us from our mission. When I was going through this back thing and, and, and everything going on with this COVID and all the crazy stuff we see going on in the world, I started praying to God. And I spent a lot of time kind of on my back there without any distractions, listening and praying to God, God, I, I want wisdom to lead your people. Father, what do we do? How do we do? How are we supposed to be part of this? And he was silent for a long time. But when it, when, when it was clear, it says, Marty, nothing's changed. The mission hasn't changed. Go make disciples. I can't tell you how that was a fresh fire for me. That was almost, that was almost a drink of a cold water. I realize he's right. John 17, 16 and 17. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. <coughs> your word is truth. Excuse me. Sanctify them. This means 
uh, this word actually means to, to render pure or to cleanse from sins. Sanctification in the Christian, in the heart of a Christian is progressive. It's, it's constant. It's becoming more and more like Christ and less and less attached to the world because it's not our citizenship, the world. Our citizenship's in heaven. Sanctify, sanctification do this. Uh, and, and, and that helps us live in the world without becoming part of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Now, your word is truth. If we're going to stay true to our mission, we must stay in God's word. If we want to know the truth, get into his word. Staying in his word, and especially as you read Acts and through the New Testament, and really how God loved the world through the Old Testament as well. And, but, but it helps us keep our mission clear. Keeping in God's word helps us keep our mission clear. Now, there's a, there's a lot of disturbing things going on right now. There really is, because the time is short. Let me read you something in uh, one of my devotions called The Upward Call by David Jeremiah. And I found this just the other day as I was reading it, and it says, In an athletic game that are played, for a set number of minutes, like basketball and football, the closer the clock gets to the final seconds, the more intense the plays become. In fact, coach practice plays to use them in times when the time's almost expired. Immediately, the increase increases intensity in the athletes and the spiritual warfare as well. Has the world ever in your time feel like there's more dire straits? Revelation 12.12 12 tells us the devil knows that he has but a short time left to disrupt, disrupt God's plans on earth. It could, should come to no surprise that the closer we get to the end of this age and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the more Satan will increase his activities. Wars, discord, disease, strife, immorality, and more and more evidence that Satan is at work. But that Jesus, when he started but what Jesus started when he came the first time destroys the work of the devil, will be concluded at his second coming. You know what he's saying there? Time is short. We can see it in, the, in, in everything that's going on. <coughs> I believe with all my heart, we're seeing prophecy fulfilled at a rate like never before. Father, uh, Jesus is coming. The time is short. For us to make disciples. You know, and it's verse 7, John 17, 18. As I send you, as you send me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. That's just what he said. He prayed for them. I'm sending them in the world to be my disciples and share me with the rest of the world. Friends, the clock is ticking. And we have a mission to do. You're sitting listening to this, maybe, and you go, why would I want to become a disciple of Jesus Christ? Why should I be, be convinced to become a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, it, first on John 10.10 10 says, a thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I've come that you could have life and have it more abundantly. But I want to tell you, there's a bigger picture than even having life more abundantly here on earth. When you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, your name is written in the book of life. Listen to what Revelation 20, 13, or 14 through 15 says. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You, I had a guy once say, why would a loving God send anybody to hell? That's why Jesus Christ came. Jesus came to give us a way to go to heaven. But the problem is we're sinners. The Romans, uh, Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. That's what we just said here in the second death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift God gave us was through His Son so we wouldn't have to be cast into the lake of fire. We could have eternal life with Him. But it came through Jesus Christ. That's the way you access heaven. That's why you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. So that you don't have to spend eternity in hell is what this is talking about. If you've never done that, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I would love to talk to you. As you can see at the end of this message, they'll put a phone number and a Facebook page and a web page there. 
call me and talk to me about it. I would love to visit with you more about how you can give your life to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, there's people watching right now that have never trusted you and never as a Lord and Savior, have never become your disciples. We're going to ask that you burn that need deep in their heart and they realize that they can have eternity. They can have heaven with you through Jesus Christ. Father, we also ask that we never lose sight of our mission as a church. Father, and we're going to ask for boldness. We're going to ask for direction. We're going to ask, Father, that we are intentional about sharing Jesus Christ with everybody. In your name, amen.